Endo meeting February 21st. Go ahead, Eric. We're going to talk about pull requests that are pending in the very... Oh, since since we last spoke, Pet Demon development has continued on the master branch of the Endo.js repository. So that's a milestone. Not as significant as it's mostly for our own convenience. So we're not living on a on a feature branch that has lived a really long time and proceeding more on a linear fashion from now on. But uh and and both of the both of the pet demon packages are marked as private currently, which is to say that they will not be published to NPM until we have audited the APIs for future compatibility. That being and but for now, it is up on blocks on multiple concurrent pull requests actively adjusting the architecture so that we can as quickly as possible get to the point where these things can connect to each other um and to that end eric what are we up to right now uh all right well uh, we are up to multiple things right now but we're going to talk about one in particular uh which is uh this github issue which i will share in the chat for the benefit of our meeting participants. The So essentially we were, uh, one thing that we're working on, uh, this PR, which was opened last week or something, is at work from, um, or work that I pulled in from Chris's uh, TCP uh, working branch uh, when we were still on the endo feature branch and when and basically it like there's this there is a context object that is associated with uh, live values in the daemon uh, and when the values are canceled they are done so through methods that are on this context object yeah. and we decided that we needed to expose this object to caplets so that they can observe their own uh cancellation and uh I believe, Chris, you're the keeper of the motivating use case uh, for why we need to do this. Right. So uh, like uh, the, the reason this has to be done now is because of network caplets that need to be able to tear down when they're when they are. Canceled. Um, potentially reincarnated. Uh, yeah, so uh, and basically the, the way, <clears throat> by the way. Stray thought, let's not forget. We probably should serialize the reincarnations end to end from the completion of the teardown to the beginning of the next incarnation, because in particular for a network caplet, you're not going to be able to listen on a socket that's still open. Uh, so. Mm, to keep in mind. Right. So don't start incarnating stuff until the cancellation has the process has completed. Right. At some, yeah, the, when, when the disposed promise is completed is when the next incarnation should begin, uh, which probably means timeouts, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Many implications. This thing is not finished. <laughs> <laughs> yes. M much work to do. <laughs> uh, right. But uh, in any event, the, uh, so the way it looks like inside of a, inside of a caplet, uh, caplets, they receive this powers object, which in this little dummy test caplet, I don't use. Uh, with this change, they also receive the context object uh, and they can call methods uh, on the uh, context uh, using eventual send. So uh, you can get the promise for your own cancellation uh, by calling this method when canceled. And so the whole point of this caplet is that you can call await cancellation on it, uh, cancel the caplet or its worker, uh, and then you should get the string canceled back. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, we tried to do this, we, uh, let's see, where are we? Ah, yes, here. <clears throat> uh, so when, uh, so in the test, when we try to do this, uh, you know, we make an unconfined bundle uh, of this like context uh, consumer caplet, the confinement doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, uh, and so we save the promise for the uh, evaluation of await cancellation. Then we call cancel, uh, and then we should observe that the result is canceled, 
what we found was, uh, looking at the endo log, uh, that things were happening out of order. In particular, despite the demon receiving uh, the uh, await cancellation evaluation first, uh, the cancellation happened before uh, the this formula was uh, added to the formula graph and the source code was uh, evaluated. And that led to the cancellation occurring before the creation of uh, the actual eval formula that we were trying to cancel and the test hangs. And uh, in order to produce the desired behavior, we had to stick a timeout uh, before the actual cancel call. And that is unacceptable and we do not want that. So uh, for this reason, we need to prevent the formula graph from being mutated concurrently. Uh, so all formula graph mutations need to be serialized. And I have, uh, and, you know, and this uh, issue goes into significant detail about uh, why this is and how to do it. Uh, but for present purposes, I have uh, a pull request up uh, where I show one way that we can go about uh, doing this. Uh, and it involves a, uh, a mutex, uh, which is not really, uh, which is not really a mutex, uh, but it is a, uh, a lock that we can put around operations, uh, that mutate the formula graph. It's so that lock. it's not a lock either. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mutual exclusion by analogy. It's just a promise. A, a promise-based music mutual exclusion carry on i th i think that we can jazz will you forgive the use of the word mutex for this do you care i, I don't know why you are asking me okay cool <laughs> then we're going to proceed <laughs> we're we, we are without looking at the implementation uh we are going to forgive the use of the uh word mutex for this thing and uh the basically like where to start with this i think we can start at where uh, evaluation begins and let's see where do we have host.evaluate i'm on github Maybe I should just open my editor instead. <laughs> okay, we're doing this in the editor. All right, so here we have the same thing. And if we go to the host and look at evaluate, the issue uh, that, or actually we're going to start in the daemon. Uh, sorry, I'm figuring out how to demo, I'm figuring out how to explain my thing, uh, live. So we have this incarnate eval, uh, here. And actually we're even going to start looking at master to see why we have problems here. So. Recently, we in a recent PR by uh, Kumavis, we introduced this notion of incarnation, which means uh, create a formula for a first time uh, for the first time and give me uh, its value. Uh, and these methods, like there is one incarnate method for each formula type, uh, they create a little JSON blob uh, that is written to disk uh, so that we can reinstantiate the value later. And we generate a formula number, uh, uh, which is just a, uh, if, uh, like a SHA-512 uh, random number. Uh, and we store, uh, we store the things that the formula needs in order to be reinstantiated, such as the identifier of its worker, uh, the names that are used inside of the source code, the values that correspond to those names, uh, et cetera. And the way this is used, uh, if we look at 
evaluate and host. This is again at master without my uh, changes. Uh, if you remember what the test looked like, uh, you know, we were first, you know, calling await cancellation and that was an eval formula that produced that await cancellation call. And then we tried to cancel it. The problem is just that this evaluate function on the host is chock full of awaits. Uh, so we got, you know, to th this, pro this proceed executed to one of these awaits. And then it was overran by the cancel operation, which has like fewer, which is faster. Uh, and then the cancellation went through before we actually got to this uh, incarnate uh, eval call. So what we want to do is we want to try to synchronize like the mutation of the in-memory formula graph as much as possible. Um, while also without like, and, and we have to put a lock around any async operations that happen uh, as part of this. And so that's really what my PR is about, uh, which is about making things synchronous that can be made synchronous and then putting locks around everything else. And so if we go back to incarnate eval in here, now uh, we have a sort of different uh, signature for this. So first of all, we introduce this mutex, uh, which we are going to call a mutex, whether it's correct or not. And I'm then we're going to call it a lock. <laughs> not a lock. Pick one. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to rename this the formula graph mutex instead of the formula graph lock. And uh, at the start of each incarnate method, uh, it enqueues any asynchronous operations that it needs to perform uh, so that they are serialized if multiple incarnations are happening at once. Oh, uh, and that- I can already tell where this is screwed. <laughs> okay, go on. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, th it, it, this works. It's just a question of like, <laughs> uh, at what cost? Don't mean, does and, it work? Oh yeah, 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 it works. Uh, yeah, even no. Okay, so if you need to incarnate a worker in order to incarnate eval, do you data lock on the internal incarnation of the worker? If I uh, don't pass it a formula number, yes. But if I do pass it a formula number, so you have, because you have this issue where you have like, you know, incarnate eval needs to call incarnate worker. Uh, the worker will acquire the lock to produce its own uh, formula number that will produce a data lock. However, uh, we have parameterized the formula number of uh, eval methods that depend on, or that are called by other eval methods. So you can just give it uh, the its formula number and then it will not acquire the lock. Okay, that's, well, that's got a conditional await there. That's not going to work with our style guide uh, but it does solve the problem. Okay. Uh, does it solve it definitively? Because you also have the, like you have to flush a write to disk and that promises. Yeah. We're going to, we're going we're gonna, to, we're going to get to that. Okay. Um, so, Harry Yes. So we have these. Uh... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, let me just queue up. Let me just flush my my stray idea, and that is that maybe these incarnation functions shouldn't be taking a serialization lock, and just the user facing APIs take the lock, and under that lock they can serialize any number of incarnations that they want. Like if you need to, if like in the in the service of evaluate, you may need to incarnate a worker, for example, um, and then you need to incarnate the eval formula. Well, if you do both of those incarnations under a single eval lock, then you've serialized the user level, the user level messages to the host. Um, and that may allow for some simplification. I am not going to suggest that you learn all about why it's a bad idea to have recursive locks. Hmm. Uh, 
Yeah, none of there is no recursive locking uh, in this implementation. Um, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. because it's avoided by uh, conditionally passing stuff. So it's like if you if you get your you can either get your dependencies uh, up front or you can lock and create them yourself. Okay, uh, so so one way to get around the okay, so so as as a matter of uh, style in order to make it possible in, in order to make it easier to review these things for correctness we do, if we forbid uh, conditional await um, just conditional await is way too hard to reason about in terms of concurrency uh, the a solution I have used in the past in that case is to create separate functions one of which is synchronous that accepts the accepts the nonce as an argument and an asynchronous function that does not accept that 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 is that in its first step must uh, must obtain the entropy necessary for the nonce asynchronously. Mm. Um, so that that's one way. It requires an additional name, but it irons out the synchronous versus asynchronous and makes it much more clear which path. Is demanding asynchrony and which one does not demand asynchrony. Mm -hmm. Then you then in the end you end up with a function that doesn't. Well, in the end you end up with a function that wouldn't be asynchronous, except that you need to flush the right lock. Yes, so they would both be. It would be like uh, it still works though. It still yeah. works though because there's a synchronous prelude. Yeah. Up to the point of writing the flush and yeah, you know, and you do all your transaction in that first in that in that. Uh, nod to Richard for coming up with the Richard. You came up with the term synchronous prelude, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, plausibly, I actually don't remember if it was literally me or if it was more like a conversational yeah, artifact. Yeah, it may have emerged from a conversation between us. I still haven't figured out whether synchronous prelude, whether we agree that synchronous prelude refers only to the case where you have a deliberate await null to demarcate or if it just refers to all of the synchronous behavior leading up to the first await regardless. I, I use it as the latter. Like, and the point of the explicit await null is to like really draw a clear line. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Synchronous prelude is a thing that exists in JavaScript. And the await null is a is a clarification of where of the termination of the synchronous prelude that we use as a matter of style. Yep. Hmm. Uh, so then so we don't want conditional awaits like both so basically we would have like we would split this into two functions you would have like incarnate serial eval or something like that um since the method would still be async uh and then you so you would have incarnate serial and just incarnate incarnate serial or incarnate serialized what do you mean by serial? Just just the fact that if you call like the incarnation operations are serialized. Uh, uh, that that's a distinction. That is a distinction based off of whether it's taking the lock, right? Yeah. Uh, and the only reason you're taking the lock is to take the number and then flush. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, that might work. That might satisfy all of the requirements. All right, proceed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so set, setting aside that this is going to be split in, into two different functions, uh, you it generates any uh, of its dependencies. So in, it incarnates any dependent values, uh, generating their formula numbers uh, for them. Uh, and here we also do the... Uh, look up formulas for any pet name paths that it receives because it's an eval formula. And now we get to uh, the IO stuff. Uh, so because the issue, one issue uh, that I ran into uh, is that inside of the, the, basically the host is responsible for mapping pet names to formula identifiers and pet names are largely abstracted away uh, from the daemon. So uh, that created a challenge because when pet names are added, they need to be written to disk. So inside of eval, like you have these, uh, 
uh, methods here called uh, petstore.write. Mm -hmm. And petstore.write, uh, you know, adds, creates the mapping uh, for the, uh, yeah. creates the mapping for the pet name and then writes it to disk. And it is, yeah. it is in inevitably it's, async. Right. It's, it's transactional in the synchronous prelude as it, and other events can proceed on the knowledge, but the, pro it still returns a promise for flushing that knowledge to disk, which is only relevant because that means that errors are observable and in the absence of an observed error, you can be confident that those formulas will exist on restart. Mm. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, because this does set this. Hmm. Yeah, so it may be that the whole, uh, that what I created to deal with this is unnecessary because of the synchronous prelude. Um, because what I did was essentially I defer these, uh, I defer calls to pet store right uh, to uh, this notion of uh, hooks. Mm -hmm. And the way uh, that that works is, is that the incarnate eval method gets an array of uh, these hooks, so-called. Mm -hmm. And they are, so you see here, like when we acquire, if we go to incarnate eval. Yeah. yeah it creates these identifiers, which has properties that we know. Mm -hmm. And the hooks depend on, you know, they are formula identifiers, they're all formula identifiers, and the hooks wants to write pet names for some of those identifiers. Yeah, yeah. So you're accumulating a, a bunch of promises that you need to flush in order to signal that you have observed all possible IO errors. Yeah. And return, yeah. So this is uh, right. And then after that, you want to return eventually the boxed, the, the boxed, promise mm -hmm. for the eval value we haven't gotten to that yet yeah. uh the yes well uh, a note before we hit a, a note so that you can hear it before you see it in a pull request review uh the the for loop should be a promise dot all for all of the mm -hmm. hooks mm -hmm. um <laughs> since uh and the difference is that that will allow the earliest failure to cause this mm. to terminate fast. Um, the and that may be irrelevant since they're serialized, but ignore me. No, no, do it as a matter <laughs> of. <laughs> um, the mm, yeah, because you don't know which order they're actually being done in the yeah and i guess we should because yeah i was going back and forth about this because like i think because with promise that all they're all started in sequence but they may finish out of sequence but i guess we shouldn't really rely on the hooks being completed in any particular order because they're right. not aware yeah. of each other anyway they're only their only potential outcome is an error and you're interested in first so if you yeah. await promise all don't yeah. return promise all <laughs> it's it's Subtle distinction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. The, uh, okay. And so once so, we so, have. So, so, so you will know that you have passed the acceptance criteria for this when you are certain that, uh, the transaction is, is, is occurring. The transactions are collectively occurring in one event. Mm -hmm. um, the like the, uh, the in memory transaction occurs in one event and then you can then you can release the lock and return a promise for the completion mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and i i have tested this with the uh context in caplet work by rebasing it on top of this and it does work uh, okay and cool. Uh, there's one uh, there's one change, one more change that was required to make that happen, which is in provide value for numbered formula, I had to create the controller first as basically create a create a synchronous or prolong the synchronous extend the synchronous prelude for this, then write the formula. Um, but other than that, yeah, it works. yeah, that sounds right. the uh... 
Yeah, that sounds right. I'm wondering whether you're going to need a, a three-stage boxed resolution. I'm not sure. Because you could return an outer box, which which it signals that the controllers have settled, mm -hmm. and then enter and then the box within that to say that I.O. has settled, um, and then a box within that for the eventual value. Yeah, there is there is a question. I do have a question. I do have a question about that because it, it 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 basically hinges on what do we do when IO fails and, and I think like what we should do when IO fails is roll everything back uh and because your formula identifier should ought to be useless um if IO fails because like if we lo if we fail to write the disk like we should consider everything lost everything dependent should just be yanked um fails it would be perfectly reasonable to kill the demon and hope that you left it in a usable state but uh again we're not journaling our changes to the yeah. disk which makes it hard <laughs> like if we were journaling our changes to disk then everything would be rolled up by a single posix rename uh mm -hmm. changing like there there would be a, a head in the object store that would be that would accumulate all of the changes of the transaction, and then when they're completed, you would re you would rename the new head over the old head, mm. and the file system and POSIX would guarantee that uh, if you were killed, if you were forcibly terminated anywhere in that process, the old head would remain. Mm -hmm. So we should. Uh... That would require us to Merkleize all of the state. Uh, to, to do Merkleize all states. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, or not use the file system as a as an object database, which is also a perfectly reasonable alternative. Like if, if yeah. we had a database that could subsumed all of these concerns of transactions, then then we would have that problem solved, and also be able to do range queries for the inventory <laughs> based off of type, for example. Uh, so yeah, uh, TBD. My yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, we're not gonna. So we're not gonna bother here about solving the IO uh, the IO problem, but we will reject the formula promise if IO fails. Is that acceptable for now? That's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I ha I haven't done the boxed resolution, and so. What we mean by that is, you know, the promise for the mutation of the formula graph, like the creation of the new formula, uh, you know, will resolve a promise for that, that is an object with a property value that is a promise for the value uh, that the formula resolves to. Uh, I have not done that yet. Uh, I don't need to do it to solve the problem that I was trying to solve for the uh, for the context, we could add it in a follow up PR uh, if we want to. All right, carry on. Uh, okay, and let's see. So we're let's see. Yeah, we were in when incarnate eval, and I think yeah, I think we were done. Yes, because we return provide value for numbered formula. That brings us to back to the host, uh, and we're done. Mm -hmm. And if we go to, uh, if we go to this ready, branch, are you ready to hear anticipatory complications? Uh, I will, <laughs> I will, uh, you can wait almost. almost. No. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer. The answer is uh, once they've shown uh, that the uh, that uh, it it before we hear the <laughs> anticipatory complications, uh, I will demonstrate uh, that it works. Uh, unconfined service can respond because here is our test. We see that there is no await here. 
Uh, this is my context and caplet branch rebased on top of these changes. Uh, and it does work as expected. Uh, now let's talk about anticipatory complications. Okay, well, let's first give you a big round of applause because that's a huge, huge chunk of complication. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, the the next complication is dot delimited uh, uh, dot delimited targets. Mm -hmm. So if you eval into networks dot TCP, for example, mm -hmm. your eval or make make TCP dot JS and name that networks dot TCP. That's mm -hmm. going to be writing a pet name not into your own pet store but into a subdirectory which means that there's another chunk of asynchronous work that has to happen up front or some so there it means that you have an additional dependency that needs to occur early where you look up where you look up networks in order mm -hmm. to find that in any case i think that you you actually are in a really good spot for that because you you specifically have done the work to make it possible to synchronously follow a link of lookups to the to the destination, and then you just leave the the tail as a name that you're writing into that into that formula. Mm -hmm. Whether to ever whether to consider extending that as a protocol over the network is another interesting consideration. Like suppose remote dot networks dot tcp. Mm -hmm. In that case, you can't just follow the you can't just synchronously follow the chain of formulas for storage that are, are synchronously available in memory. Then you would have to resort to uh, the lookup protocol over the network, mm -hmm. and then you would have to to write into the destination. You would need to resort to another API that doesn't exist yet. I'm tentatively thinking of it as deposit, mm -hmm. where you deposit the nonce of the thing that was generated and then provide the reverse lookup address so that the remote can construct a formula that refers to the object that exists in your nonce locator. Mm -hmm. Wait, uh, is the non locator an abstraction that already exists, kind of, or one that we are going to create uh you've 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 built most of it, it it's you're refactoring your way to having a nonce locator the nonce locator in its uh the nonce locator is really really trivial in its base case it's just an object with a locate method that takes a nonce mm -hmm. and looks up the corresponding value in the uh in the memo the one big memo of all nonces to all corresponding controllers and then under the controller, the corresponding value. But that that only works if there is a current incarnation for that nonce. So the refactoring that you and Aaron have been doing gets mm -hmm. us to a position where we can actually look at the disk and see if we had a formula for an arbitrary nonce that hasn't been incarnated. And ah. then you, yeah. So, so if you get a nonce for a worker that's not running, for example, you would look at formulas slash worker nonce slash or uh, worker nonce dot json and then it would say type worker and that's your that's your hint that that object actually exists and should be incarnated locally ah so it's so it's essentially the formula identifier for ref weak map with extra fixings for, for looking... things that are not currently incarnated yeah mm, okay uh, and that's the part, and then the the in case it hasn't been previously incarnated is the piece that I've never written. The other the, the part where it's in memory. Oh, that was easy. I hacked that. Out. Yeah. Oh, Whatever. wait. I made I named the wrong map. It's not formula identifier for ref. It's the sibling one. Right. That, go, that goes nonce value, not value nonce. But right. yes. Or value nonces now, right? Oh, val value nonces. Uh, once my PR for that is merged. Yeah. Okay, so uh, cool. We're in a good spot. Nice. So the main, uh, so the main, the main two things that need to change is no, no conditional awaits need to be removed. We split it into two functions that are called uh, because you know that are called conditionally as necessary. Um, 
Yeah. The distinct because the distinction between uh, I take it I take it the consensus the agoric consensus position is that it is considerably easier easier to call you know two different functions conditionally than to have conditional awaits within a function. Well, you're not doing a con in in the uh, at the call site you know mm -hmm. that you have a formula identifier or not, mm -hmm. so you don't need a conditional await anymore. Right, but if the um... oh, but if they gave you a pet name, then then you have a formula identifier, and you don't have to. Well, you... hmm. yeah. I'll just I'll just do it. <laughs> let, me, let me know what happens if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if it runs into a dead end. Let me know. Yep, yep. Uh, I I don't I I do not expect it will it will work. Uh, it will not run into a dead end um the that question was more academic and then yeah i'm going to take that async for loop and turn it into promise all and i think and then i will retag you for uh further opinions all right now let's it's five to the hour i say that's enough for today uh does anybody have any further questions ideas, sentiments. You're muted. Good luck. Talk. Yeah, <laughs> I was saying good luck. There was a lot, there's a lot going on there. I was trying my best to be flying the wall. Um, yeah. And uh, I did look at that next JS thing. ZB, I responded back to your comment. Uh, so yeah, I just want to make it clear that Samuel from Agoric is the one who opened up that issue initially. So as for like what the ask is there, it's not really totally clear to me. Uh, but yeah, uh, with Next.js, it seems as though, uh, so I'm on track. I mean, uh, I seem to be doing everything the, the correct way with using the, the document component. And it is loading the endo init script on the server side. It's loading it, but it's not calling lockdown until it gets on the client side. So yeah, I'm not sure if there's any, if you've dealt with that or if there's any, uh, uh, yeah, input you have on, you know, sending already locked down JavaScript from the server to the client. Uh, no, that's that's not going to be possible because lockdown is a, a state of the realm. So we can't send the realm from the server side to the client side. We have to lock down on the client side if we want our client side locked. Uh, what I what I need to know is what the original intention in this issue was if it was to lock down the server or the client, because uh, from the error message, it seems that uh, the implementation there uh, succeeds in attempting to lock down the server, which might not be the intention. Uh, seems unlike it started. No, I, I, so for one, I think I, I tapped ZB on this one because it seemed like it might be related to common JS, and I guess it's not. <laughs> It's so, not. so at this point, ZB, you are free. This is no longer your issue. Please give it to someone else. But since, but since you've gotten deeper than I have, um, I can I can say with some certainty that the client needs to be locked down. I think that the need is to be able to do the the, the need is for a client to be able to use CapTP. Okay. Uh, so uh, the way uh, Thomas is. Uh, locking things down is definitely uh, closer to what we want. I'm not sure if it's the thing we want uh, based on React Native experience where uh, calling lockdown within code that's handled by the framework uh, was uh, effectively too late. So if we imported yeah. uh, SAS 
through the import facilities of the part of the application that is being bundled, it was too late to call lockdown. Uh, and it was not visibly obvious. Uh, we only discovered that uh, after uh, Leo spent a bunch of time attempting to fix uh, incompatibilities that only stemmed from uh, things existing before lockdown. And yeah. we then moved lockdown earlier and had a different set of incompatibilities to solve. Right. Yeah, the uh, the general advice from the maintainers of CES is that if you're doing client-side lockdown, it should be done in a script before the application has an opportunity to load, like a separate script tag. And some frameworks make it hard to express that because the bundler attempts to convert the script tag into something else. Oh, uh, well, so next no JS. script tag in Next.js because the, uh, the they... React components on the back end uh, create a structure that is then being sent to the client uh, and assembled there into the client side with React components. So uh, with the newest Next.js, you don't really have... I mean, I'm no expert. I'm just uh, riffing off stuff I heard, but you don't really have a good place to edit your HTML. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a good meeting. I'm going to press stop.